Good afternoon, everybody. So up first, we have Dr. Eric Verdon. He is the president and CEO of the Buck Institute for Research on Aging. He's also a professor at the Leonard Davis School of Gerontology at the University of Southern California. Last but not least, he's a professor at the University of California, San Francisco. Welcome, Dr. Verdon. Good afternoon, villagers. I want to start by uh, thanking um, Aviv Clinic for putting this meeting together. I think there's nothing that pleases me more than to actually um, uh, meet and, and, and present the work that we're doing and, and to share it with you. Um, I also want to congratulate you for being here. Uh, as you will see, um, uh, lifespan, health span is all about taking care of your own health. And this is going to be one of the messages that I'm going to be sharing with you. And by being here, you're already showing that you've taken the first step and at least a critical step in, in taking your own health into your hands. So let, let me start by asking you a question with a raise of hand. Who wants to live to 100? Okay, right. It's high, but it's, uh, it's not everybody. And I, I think it's going to be an important point that I'm going to bring back this, this question later and, and decide, you know, why did you answer in the way you did? Um, I have uh, organized my presentation in a number of breakthroughs. And I think this is really one of the messages I, I want to share with you is that there has been a, a, an undergoing revolution in our understanding of the science of aging. And we, we lie right now at a critical point where in the last 20 years of, 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 of work, we have redefined what aging is and really what it means to, to, to grow old. And I think this revolution is slowly permeating and entering the realm of clinical medicine. And Aviv Clinic is a good example of this. And therefore, one of the messages that I would like you to leave with is um, to do everything to be able to capitalize on this revolution, which will really change in a dramatic way the way we age in the future. So four breakthroughs I'm going to be sharing with you quite quickly, just to give you a glimpse of what aging research is today and what have we accomplished. The first finding is that we can change the rate of aging. Doesn't that sound amazing? Uh, 25, 30 years ago, this was thought impossible. And through work of, of many colleagues, we really have uh, been able to identify a number of dials, things that exist within your organism that we can trigger, uh, either through a lifestyle intervention or through a drug that will change the rate of aging. This happens in animal models. And I'm going to give you a first example uh, of a classical experiment, which is actually almost 100 years old, where whereby we can study the aging of mice in, in the laboratory. And what I'm showing you here is what we call life curves. Um, so we're starting with 100 animals uh, on the top left, and we follow these animals. As the animals die, the curve goes down. And you can see in orange, non-CR is... Oh, so apologies. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for keeping me on track. <laughs> uh, you can see in the top left, um, we start with 100 animals as these animals die. Uh, look at the line non-CR, they progressively die, and by the time they reach 36 months, this is the maximum lifespan of a mouse, all of all the mice in that colony have died. Now suppose you take these mice uh, and measure how much they're eating individually, uh, what we call ad lib, they're eating as much as they want, the food is always available. What we do then is we restrict the amount of calories that they have available uh, by 25%, and you can see the curve sh shifting to the right. And what this means is now these mice are living longer on average. But look at what happens when you're restricting this by 65%, the mice are living almost twice as long. So this is actually pretty amazing to think that there is all that life potential that was locked in and not made up. Now, calorie restriction, as you can probably imagine, is not easy to do. There's a, there's a calorie restriction society in America, so uh, some all the people actually have taken upon themselves to, to go on calorie restriction. And it's very hard. Uh, I've met many of these people on calorie restriction. And uh, some colleague told me one time, you know, this might not make you live forever, but it will certainly feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we don't 
recommend this as an intervention, even though it is interesting to see what happens to these individuals who do this. So this is the type of intervention that, when you do it in mice, allows us now to use all of the modern tools of molecular biology and genetics that we do in the lab in trying to understand what are the links within the cells, within the organism, that are able to recognize that there's less food and to, and to transform this into an increased lifespan. And so these are the type of experiments that we can conduct in animal models. I'm showing you a little worm, C. elegans, it lives 21 days. The fruit fly, Drosophila, which lives 70 days. And then mice, as I mentioned, that live um, up to three years. Now we can, we have a calorie restriction and we have a long life underneath. So we can, again, using all of the tools of molecular biology and modern biology, uh, identify the path, what we call pathways. These are a ser ser series of molecules in these organisms that are critical. If you remove them and you put these animals on carrier restriction, no more response. And so we and, and many others in the field have been busy doing this type of work. Uh, and this is what we found. Now, this looks very complicated, but I want to point out a few critical points. You probably will notice that there's a, a yellow ball called TOR. Um, in every one of the organisms. So that was one of the important points. We have identified pathways and molecules that are conserved between all of these organisms, indicating that the regulation of aging is something that happens, you know, from the little lonely worm that lives 21 days all the way to us. We also have TOR. You have TOR in every one of your cells. That's one finding. So aging pathways are conserved and they function pretty similarly in different organisms. The second finding is TOR is named TOR because it means target of rapamycin. And rapamycin is actually a drug that's available in the clinic today. And the implication is that, and it's been demonstrated, if you put any one of these animals on rapamycin, they live longer, up to 20 or 30%. So these are animals now that are living a complete normal life. We don't change anything else to their, uh, their conditions under which they live, but Simply by taking this drug, they live 20 to 30 percent longer. Remarkable finding. And today, after about 20 years of research, we have in mice uh, more than 100 interventions that will do exactly this. Many of these interventions, as pointed on the left, are actually drugs. Some of them are already in the clinic. Metformin. I suspect we have in the audience a number of you who are in glucophage. Glucophage, metformin, is a, a drug that you know, seems to be having anti-aging effect. Acarbose is another drug in the clinic. I mentioned rapamycin already. And there's a whole series of them, about a hundred, that are slowly moving from the early lonely models to the clinic and into humans. I should say also that none of those have been demonstrated in humans yet, but the efforts are ongoing. And my prediction is within the next five to 10 years, we will have the first drug approved in the clinic that will delay aging. So think about this, and, and think about it especially at the end of the talk. Um, breakthrough number two is, um, is the realization that aging is the largest risk factor for what we call non-communicable non disease. If you think about in 1900s, actually most of us were dying from infectious diseases, tuberculosis, pneumonia, and so on. All of these infectious diseases have been rep replaced due to antibiotics, vaccination, by a whole series of new diseases that are shown here. A and you will recognize them. Atherosclerosis, heart attack, stroke, glaucoma, macular degeneration, many forms of cancer are linked to aging, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, hip fracture, knee pain, um, hearing loss, sarcopenia, Alzheimer, Parkinson, type 2 diabetes, how much fun it is to get old. And, and the reason, so I ask you the question, who wants to live to 100? A significant fraction of you actually said, yes, I do want to, but I, I would say pretty much half of the audience said no. And I suspect if I were to change my question and ask you, who wants to live to 100, not afflicted by all of these conditions? Please raise your hand. <laughs> yeah. So that, that is the, the key thing that I want you to remember. Aging is associated with diseases in a way that by the time you reach 65, 70% of the American population will suffer from one of these conditions. By the time you reach 70, 
about most of the people will have two of these conditions. So we associate aging with disease for a very good reason. We've seen our parents, we've seen ourselves, our friends suffer from these debilitating conditions. And in some way, they really color the way we think about aging. Aging is debilitating, it's diminished capacity, and so on. Now, what I want to point to you is that in our laboratory experiments with the animals, the equation that aging means disease is disrupted. These animals not only live longer, but they also live healthier. And we also know in our midst, we have centenarians who live not only to 100, but they don't start being sick typically until age 95 on average. So your typical centenarians will spend 5% of their lives afflicted by these conditions versus the rest of us will spend about 15% of their lives, 65 to about 78, 80. So, and th there lies really the, the greatest potential of this field. People talk about longevity. Some of my more crazy colleagues talk about immortality and living to 150 and living to 200. Uh, frankly, I think it's all nonsense. And this is not what I'm working on. I'm working on really improving the, 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 the aging experience that we all live today. And I, I will make the point later that most of the people in this audience, if you were to optimize everything you can about your lifespan, could be expected to live to 90, 95 in good health. Now think about this and, and, and think about what you're seeing around you. Now, breakthrough number three is uh, this will lead to every invention of medicine. Uh, so think about how medicine works today. We call it healthcare. It's actually not healthcare, it's sick care. Uh, medicine is focused on, on, on really treating you when you are ill. Medicine does very little prevention. It's organ based. You go see a cardiologist, you go see a neurologist. Each of these doctors is talking to you as if you were an organ, not a person. And, and you've all experienced this. Um, it's reactive. That is, we wait for disease to occur and then we treat it. And medicine does an amazing job at this. I don't want to diminish the, the, the merits of medicine. Uh, we manage disease and we pretty much give a almost universal treatment. If you have high cholesterol, you get on a statin, even though we know that only one out of 20 people who are on the statins will actually benefit from it. Now, what is the vision of this for the future? Think about a true healthcare system where uh, it is system-based. Remember TOR. TOR is not just in the heart or in the brain. It's in every cell in your body. So when you get rapamycin, TOR will affect... Uh, rapamycin will affect the activity of TOR in every one of your cells. So you will prevent disease in every single organ. Um, it's also proactive and preventative. That is, we instead of waiting for you to actually be afflicted by a disease, we will start very early. And finally, it is personalized. And this is using the new tools of, of what we call precision medicine. So life, last question is, what drives aging? Is it genes or lifestyle? You probably have, in, in the back of your mind, a thought that, well, my parents did not live very old, so you know I, I should probably prepare to not to live very old either. And, and a lot of people actually do think this. There's another group of people who think, no, my lifestyle is actually going to make a difference. So let me ask again another question. Uh, if you were to decide what, what, what is most important, your genes that you've inherited from your parents, uh, about which you cannot do anything, or is it the way you live that's going to be a major determinant in terms of your life expectancy? So first, the gene, the gene believers. Who believes it is genes? Okay. Who believes it is 50-50? Okay, and then the rest, I guess, who believes it is lifestyle? Okay, well, I'm, I'm about to surprise you. 93% um, non-genetics, lifestyle, about 7% genetics, meaning that your longevity, your health span, your lifespan is going to be determined by how you choose to live. Now, the other thing also, it's never too late. Even late-stage late interventions have very powerful effect in your longevity. So, I'm sorry, I guess I was missing uh, that slide. Um, now, what, what is lifestyle? And this is what I'm going to finish uh, in, the next, in the last uh, 15 minutes. Um, I, I look at this as what I call the five pillars of aging. And um, these five pillars of aging, you probably know about them, at least to some degree, and I suspect many of you 
uh, as success successful retirees are actually practicing many of those. But I believe there's also an enormous gap between what we are learning that actually works and what people indeed practice in their daily lives. And, and this is really what the focus of my work at the Buck Institute and, and, and many of our colleagues is to understand which one of all these interventions is actually functioning in the best way. So what are they? On the left, nutrition, what you eat, when you eat. Everybody knows about this, uh, but you know, what are you supposed to do? Uh, there's a lot to be learned. Second one is physical activity, which I believe is the greatest anti-aging medicine we have today and that we're going to have for the next five to 10 years. Next one is uh, sleep, uh, probably one of the most important ones that you can optimize. Um, and stress mitigation, you know, managing your stress in a successful manner. The fourth one is uh, what uh, we call as human connection. And believe it or not, it is the strongest predictor of your uh, life expectancy. And the fact that you're here as a community, that you live in a wonderful community, that you have a lot of friends, that you are engaged socially, is the strongest predictor of your life expectancy. This is what the data says. Now, unfortunately, it's very hard for us to study in mice. I don't know how mice are feeling about, <laughs> are, are feeling about each other and when they, but we know, for example, if we, if we grow our mice lonely in cages by themselves versus four or five or how we usually do it, their lifespan is shortened. That's been shown in many species. And there are a lot of people trying to understand what, what, what is it? But it's not only a human connection, there's also, um, a sense of purpose. What are you here for? Are you of service uh, to your family, to your friends, to community, to the world? These are all sort of very hard things for a scientist to study, but they are incredibly important. Last one, last, bu last bucket that I'm showing you here is the drugs. And the drugs are not here. And I think I want to be totally honest. Even though, you know, some people have already started to take metformin, even though they're not diabetics. You'll hear about this from my colleague, Dr. Barzilai, later. Um, these have not proven. And so, you know, people make individual decisions in terms of whether they are wanting to go on these drugs at this point. But I can tell you the answers will come in the next few years. So the idea that I really want to encourage you to look at is these four buckets on the left are what you should be focusing on today with all of the intention that you have, because the bucket on the right, the drugs will come in the future and might give you a further boost. So. Every time I give a talk, people say, well, what's the take home message? What, what am I supposed to do? Uh, what can I do today to maximize my health span and my lifespan? Um, now let's start by the, the worrying and the sad news. Um, today in the US, uh, we have a shorter life expectancy than almost any, any other high income countries, the Western world, including Japan and so on. And, and, and paradoxically, we spend most uh, in the world on healthcare, and we are 31st in life expectancy. Let me show you what it looks like. So this is the, the life expectancy in the US. You can see we've been lagging for a while behind the rest of the Western world. And this has been even further precipitated with COVID-19. Uh, you can see the really rapid dip um, down to 76, where most Western countries today are around 82. Now. I want to congratulate for living in Florida because I live, I live in California. You live in Florida. These are the blue areas you can see. Um, and there's an incredible disparity uh, in terms of life expectancy uh, in this country, which is very strongly regional. But we can also see this, this at the level of different communities. If you do the same study in Glasgow, it's been done in Glasgow and London and in Cleveland, you can see depending on the zip code uh, where and how long you're going to live. In fact, your zip code is one of the strongest predictor of your life expectancy, par paradoxically, which means, you know, which makes sense. If you live in a, in a more educated, wealthy uh, community, you have more time to exercise, you have access to organic food versus living, you know, in an urban ghetto where you actually have access to no vegetables, where you are, you're working three jobs and so on. So it just makes a lot of sense. And the, I, I can say, I don't, I have not seen the data for this particular area, but I, I'm, I'm almost ready to predict that it is a very long-lived community. Now, I've made the point earlier that most of you today could expect to, to live to 1995 in good health. 
how, how am I able to say this, is that we know when we look at some unique zip codes, there are communities in the US today that live to, where average life expectancy is 88. And one of those is right next to where I live, it's a town called Ross in, 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 in Northern Marin County. And I can tell you that when I go to this community, uh, not everybody has exercising, not everybody has a perfect diet. I mean, obviously as a wealthy community, people are doing a lot more than other areas, but 88 is even without optimizing everybody. Hence the prediction that 95 is not a far cry from where we are. So I want to review, um, uh, because you're still wondering, each of you, okay, what am I supposed to do? I won't be able, unfortunately, in 30 minutes to go through everything that you should be doing, but I want to give you at least a framework in which you can think about your own longevity and what you can do to optimize it. Um, this is a study that was published uh, in the uh, Journal of American Heart Association, looking at the impact of healthy lifestyle factors. Because you might wonder, okay, I exercise, but I like, I like my alcohol and I, I like to eat what I want. And, and so what is the effect of this exercise versus this one? So what is the relative impact of each of these variables? So this is what the study did. They looked at a number of healthy lifestyle factors and, and measured their effect on life expectancy in the US population. And this was actually done by combining uh, something called the nurse health study and the health professional follow-up study. Uh, 123,000 people were studied in this. They were all sent questionnaires to try to assess. So there are some variables people might not have answered exactly, but I think it's a pretty strong indication. And that study is a landmark in the field of, of preventative health. So the conclusion of that paper is that what they preconize, what they recommend, is a recipe for increasing your life expectancy by 12 to 14 years. They identified a number of low-risk low risk lifestyle factors that actually really maximize your longevity. Some of them are completely obvious, but some others not so. Regular exercise, again, I go back, the best anti-aging medicine you will have ever, uh, at least for the for foreseeable future. Moderate alcohol consumption. I usually hate to bring this up to people. We have been sold the myth that alcohol actually increases your lifespan. Um, I, the only thing I have to say regarding these studies is the idea that um, many of these studies were supported by the alcohol industry. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, you draw your own conclusion. Um, and I've made the point in front of audiences like this that alcohol is the new tobacco. Remember how we were sort of delusional about what tobacco meant in the 70s or 60s? And then we had a movement um, essentially eliminating tobacco from most of our lives. And, you know, cancer rates went down and, and heart attacks went down and so on. The same thing will happen with alcohol. And I think I am not recommending for people to abstain from alcohol, but I'm certainly discouraging them from using alcohol, thinking that it will improve their health. It will not. It increases cancer, it increases Alzheimer's, it increases pretty much every complication that we, that we can think of. And the people who don't drink live longer, period. So that, that I still drink, but I drink in moderation and I drink for very special occasions. Maybe one or two glasses a week. That's, and I feel a lot better. My sleep is much better. Uh, I feel stronger, healthier, clearer, clearer, clearer minded. So take this one home and, <laughs> and think about it. Um, no smoking, that, that's a no-brainer. Uh, High-quality diet, I'll say a few words about this, and, and a healthy weight were the, the, really the key low-risk um, uh, lifestyle factors. Regular exercise. Again, um, the data here is a little complicated to look at. I just want you for every one of them to look at what's happening here on the left uh, between the people who actually are exercising five, more than five and a half hours per week, uh, gain an extra 80 years of life. Um, three and a half uh, hours a week, almost the same thing. So there's a large diminishing return. Once you reach a certain peak of exercise, you can keep exercising more, you can do it because you like it, but in terms of if you want to get the maximum bang for your buck, three and a half hours a week, that's 30 minutes per day. As retirees, uh, I, would, I would venture to say that you at least have an hour a day to exercise. So, and and I, I do exercise an hour, an hour a day. 
And frankly, it's not only thinking about longevity, it's just a question of well-being. Uh, it, it suppresses depression. It does everything that you can probably hope uh, from, from a wonder drug. And this is true for females um, and males. So remember, that's 15 minutes of walking in the morning and at night. And I would hope that uh, you would all commit to me that when I come back next year, this is something that has changed. And I, if you don't do it because you have a problem of mobility, uh, which is, can become significant, get a stationary bicycle, uh, join a gym class, do water aquatics. There are so many ways to exercise, but physical activity is the basis of, of healthy longevity. No, smoke, no smoking, period. That's an obvious one. Uh, if you are a smoker, uh, you lose. You can lose up to uh, uh, 10 years of life, 12, 12 years in males. Uh, uh, that should be a no-brainer. High-quality diet. Again, uh, people here were... Um, uh, uh, I'll just, since I'm running out of time, about six, six to four years of extra life. Um, the, the, the things that you should really be focusing on are listed here. Um, five servings of vegetables per day. Uh, extra serving of green leafy vegetable. Skip the French fries. Uh, doesn't mean you cannot. I, I'm, I'm against any absolutist uh, uh, diet, for example. I, I don't support the vegetarianism or veganism. Um, the question is, there are a number of things that we all love. I'm Belgian, by the way, originally from Belgium, but so I love French fries. And it's a really, for those of you who've traveled to Belgium, we have the best muscles and French fries. And it's impossible for me to imagine life without eating French fries from, from time to time. And I suspect it's the same for all of you. Just don't eat them every day. And if you're eating them twice a week, eat them once a week and enjoy them even, even more. So four servings of fruits, uh, avoid fruit juice. And this is one of the biggest myths in the world, that fruit juice is healthy. Fruit juice is like Coca-Cola. Again, there's no difference. From a metabolic point of view, it's not healthy. And you should never have, certainly not in the morning for breakfast. Um, second thing that I hope will change. 15 minutes of walk in the morning and at night, no fruit juice. Um, uh, eat fruits, totally different. Eat an orange, because the, the orange, the juice comes, the same, same amount of juice is actually present in the context of fiber in little cells. When you chew on an orange, you probably feel these little cells breaking in individually. You don't break all of them. The rest goes into your stomach, your intestine, and is slowly digested. That means the sugar from the fruit sort of drips into your bloodstream very slowly, and, and therein li li lies the key. Five or six servings of gr whole grain drape a day, um, one serving of protein from nuts, legumes, or tofu, eat fish at least once a week, and uh, add healthy fats like olive oil, avocados, skip the butter, it depends if it, what kind of butter, but in general, try to favor uh, these um, uh, healthy oils and avoid seed oils. Uh, you probably have heard about the seed oils, uh, really to be avoided. You can read more about it online. Again, moderate alcohol consumption. I've said already, um, alcohol should be a special treat, something that you enjoy on an occasion. Um, not Certainly not every day. I, I don't find it uh, a healthy or a helpful. And maintain a healthy weight, which is going to happen as a function of all the other changes that you're making. If you're eating regularly and if you're eating a lot of fibers and vegetables, very hard to gain weight eating vegetables. Now, here's the most important slide, because you might wonder, because this is nice, but I, I do one of these and I don't do the other. I drink, I like, like to have three glasses of wine a day. Um, is that the fact that these interventions stack up? So, and this is shown here. Uh, each of these uh, low-risk life factor counts for one. And what you can see here, if you add them up, eventually you get to 14 years of extra life in women, 12 years of extra life in men. And so the, the framework that I would like for you to, to think about this is, I think about, for my own health, I think about them as buckets. So I have a bucket for nutrition, I have a bucket for uh, or bank account, uh, same, same way. I think about them as individual account. It doesn't mean that I have to be perfect on everything every day, but every time I put something in an account or a bucket, it's an investment in the future. And since we know they work together, the more you put in each of these buckets, the better you will do. So 
as you go through your day in the next few days, think about these five different categories and think about making, ma making one change every day about the way you exercise or the way you eat. I guarantee you that at the end of the month, you will start feeling better if you're not feeling good. If you're doing all of this already, congratulations. I think I, you didn't even need to come today. Um, so uh, all of the advices basically adds up. Adherence to a low-risk lifestyle means a longer life. Uh, this could prolong, prolong life expectancy at age 50 by close to 14 years and 12 years for men. Um, and again, uh, we'll be back next year. I think uh, I, I work with the Yaviv Clinic, who has been a pioneer in actually bringing this type of revolution to, uh, to, to the clinic. And uh, hopefully next year I, I, can, I can have a whole lecture about nutrition or a whole about exercise because you probably still left, you know, what form of exercise is better. There, there is, that's the last point that I'll make since I have 29 seconds. Uh, <laughs> I want to use all of, oh, actually, I'm already over. Uh, so I, I will wrap up and I will thank you for attention and uh, see you next year.